Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Arm Scholar Podcast. This is podcast number 15. And in this podcast, I wanted to cover the topic that is pretty much blowing up my inbox, my um, mail, my DMs, just everything. And that is the California handgun roster in the recent decision that was issued last Monday in the Boland v. Bonta case. This, of course, is very important for residents in the state of California, for gun owners in the state of California, because this is a direct impact on our ability to acquire handguns that a lot of us want to have access to. But because of the Unsafe Handgun Act, we have been essentially barred or banned from being able to get access to these types of handguns. There are, of course, uh, caveats to all of that, but the topic we're going to be talking about in this podcast is going to be the handgun roster, Bolin v. Bonta, another case that has a potential to help us as well, which is the Rena v. Bonta case, and then also just the state of California's general response to this decision and some of these statements and indications that they've made in response to this decision. Now, before we jump into this podcast, I want to thank one of the main supporters of the podcast, which is Blackout Coffee. Blackout Coffee is huge. Uh, Second Amendment supporters, they support organizations like GOA and FPC. They have dedicated roasts that if you purchase, proceeds go to those organizations. So they have amazing coffee and they're huge Second Amendment supporters. So I highly recommend you check them out. I will leave links down below. And if you use the code ARMSCHOLAR, you can get 10% off of your order. So jumping right into this, again, the podcast is going to be covering the California handgun roster. This is something that's become very important. And just this weekend when I was going around, I went to a gun store uh, to pick up some items that I had on a 10-day waiting period. Um, the general question and the general discussions at the gun stores were my takes on the California handgun roster, what's going to happen, the Bolin v. Bonta decision, and just some of the implications of all of this. So I thought, again, this would be a good topic for the podcast because this is the thing everybody is really focused on right now, especially in the state of California. So if you're not familiar with what the California handgun roster is, let me cover that just real quick. The California handgun roster is just a term used um, for a list of firearms that are deemed safe for sale in the state of California. The state of California under the Unsafe Handgun Act has a bunch of restrictions, um, some of them being feature requirements, including micro stamping, uh, loaded chamber indicators and magazine disconnects that a handgun must have, and they must have all three of those, including being drop safe as well. They must have all those safety features to be deemed safe for sale in the state of California. If they are deemed safe for sale in the state of California, then they make their way onto the handgun roster and are approved for sale. Generally, when we talk about the handgun roster, we are kind of talking about a combination of all these things, but the roster itself is just simply a list of approved handguns that can be sold to the average California gun owner when they walk into a gun store. So in the state of California, you have to have these safety feature requirements to get put on that roster. Some caveats to that is that when the roster was made, um, a lot of handguns were grandfathered in and made their way onto the roster and are approved for sale currently, even though they don't have really any of those features. When you talk about something like a Gen 3 Glock, yeah, it's drop safe, but it doesn't have a magazine disconnect. It doesn't have a loaded chamber indicator, and it certainly does not have micro stamping. So there are some handguns that were grandfathered in and that are on the roster. And even when you we talk about this lawsuit that we're going to be covering, the Bowling Bonta and some of the other lawsuits, the challenge was to the safety features and then the roster itself. So we kind of need to cabin those two things because it's going to be important for some of the things we talk about later, where the Boland case was a challenge to the safety feature requirements, including the magazine disconnect, the micro stamping, and then the load chamber indicator, whereas Rena is a little bit more comprehensive of a challenge where it actually attacks the penal codes at large, I think 3200 and some of the other ones, and that includes the roster itself. So in the state of California, there is this handgun roster is what you hear it referred as. Now, even though there is a handgun roster, in the state of California, there are multiple ways where you can acquire and legally acquire and legally possess off-roster handguns. One of the primary ways that a lot of people got access to off-roster handguns was through private party transactions or transfers. 
And what ended up happening a lot in the state of California is you would have a law enforcement officer who would purchase an off-roster handgun because in the state of California, under these penal codes, law enforcement officers and peace officers and, and other individuals were exempt from the um, Unsafe Handgun Act. So they could purchase off-roster handguns. And then what would happen is they would have and acquire those off-roster handguns. And if down the road they decided they wanted to sell those on the secondary market, they could do that. They would be able to sell those on the secondary market, transfer them to just an average gun owner who wasn't a law enforcement officer, um, and they could do that through a private party transfer. Now, what ended up happening in the state of California, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are like me, when you wanted to get access to one of these off-roster handguns, you would have to pay a premium because it's on the secondary market. For example, I have quite a few off-roster handguns that I purchased on the secondary market. Um, one of the more recent ones was a Glock 43. And that Glock 43, I think, cost me like $1,200 because it was off roster. Whereas, you know, in just a normal state, a Glock 43 is maybe even cost you $500, $600. So you can see how this uh, secondary market really inflated the costs for off roster handguns. But it wasn't impossible for you to get your hands on an off roster handgun. There was also situations where you could purchase something maybe where you lived out of state, you were an out of state resident, you purchased a gun or a handgun that was maybe off roster. And then when you moved to the state of California, you could bring that off roster handgun with you, you would just need to register it with the state of California. And you could maintain possession of it going forward. And then you could also sell it on the secondary market if you wanted down the road. So there were ways around this. And again, one of the big exemptions was for police officers, police officers had access to off roster handguns. And even in the lawsuit, you heard the judge reference to almost every single law enforcement officer and agency right now in the state of California is using off roster handguns, which are deemed unsafe. They're using those in the line of duty. So the handgun roster is really one of those interesting uh, issues. And these lawsuits were very interesting because the law, how it's structured in itself is very ridiculous. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then also it's impacting what the Supreme Court has said is the quintessential self-defense weapon, which is handguns. So it's banning and restricting your access to the quintessential self-defense weapon, which are handguns, which if you just even looked at Heller, when they talked about categorical bans on handguns are impermissible, even under Heller before Bruin, we should have been able to get rid of this stuff. But you had the Ninth Circuit not adhere to Heller. They were using interest balancing, the two-step approach, and it wasn't until Bruin that we got a lot of traction, finally, in these cases. And this decision here, Boland, relied heavily on the Bruin decision and the text as informed by relevant history standard that's in Bruin. So that just kind of sets the framework of what we're dealing with in the state of California, the handgun roster itself, and then the safety feature requirements, which are an aspect of the Unsafe Handgun Act. So the decision we got in Boland v. Bonta, which hit this last Monday, as I'm filming this, was very important. It's it's a very critical win. Um, I know some people are saying, well, this isn't a big enough win because it only attacked the design features. But even if you were to say that, and this is just my feelings, even if you were to say, well, like this didn't get rid of the roster itself, essentially what it did is it made the roster toothless. Yes, there may still be a roster and yes, you manufacturers may still need to send those firearms to the DOJ for approval. They must still be drop safe, but almost every single handgun is drop safe. I mean, pretty much. I mean, right now, modern handguns, almost all of them are drop safe. And if they're not, they don't do well for sales and people don't buy them. So, and they will be pulled because it's just negligent on the manufacturer's part. But almost all of them are drop safe. So when they get submitted to the DOJ, the DOJ will have to put them on the roster uh, because those safety features are gone. And like I said, it essentially makes the roster toothless because the whole point of the roster was to prevent handguns from getting on that list. But by removing those safety feature requirements, almost any handgun get on the list. Now, yes, the DOJ can decide that they want to slow walk the process uh, for manufacturers. They're going to have to submit those handguns to be tested by the DOJ. They got to pay exorbitant fees to the state of California. They got to renew those fees to the state of California. So the roster itself does add still some barriers, but without the safety feature requirements, it's toothless for the most part. 
I guess one of my major concerns right now, even after the Bolin decision is yes, the DOJ in the state of California can decide to slow walk the process, um, claim that they are so bogged down by all the manufacturers submitting their designs and their firearms to the state of California for approval that maybe there would be some sort of issue um, and they could pretty much just say that they're bogged down and then we wouldn't see a lot of these handguns trickle onto the roster for a while, but eventually they will get on the roster. I've also heard some people kind of show concern about, well, we have the um, three and one rule in the state of California that was passed where if one handgun gets put on the roster, three of the older ones are removed. Um, yes, that could be a concern. There are litigation right now going on against that law in the state of California. So that may go away in its own right, but really nothing prevents the manufacturer then to resubmitting those ones that fell off the list. So let's say, Glock goes in, they say, we want to submit our Gen 5, and they get their Gen 5 Glocks put on the roster, and then let's say maybe the Gen 3s fall off. Well, they could just go in down the road and put the Gen 3s back on. The issue with the issue prior with the three for one rule was that if something fell off the roster, especially older designs, since they were grandfathered in, it would have become impossible for them to get back on because they had to have those safety features, which none of these have the safety feature. But once you remove that, there nothing prevents these manufacturers from being able to get those back on. So you can see how really, like I said, the roster becomes toothless. It kind of starts to implode upon itself, even though there's all these laws built on this, like the three and one, it doesn't become impossible to get those back on because you don't need these safety features. Now, again, there's fees and slow walking probably from the DOJ, and there might be some other things that maybe hinder old designs from getting back on. But uh, a lot of people in the state of California, you know, we have our Gen 3 Glocks and a lot of people, you know, there's plenty of them out there where you could probably do with their private party transfers. You know, there's some laws trying to, you know, potentially impact stuff like that. Um, but I know a lot of people, you know, if you had access to a Gen 4, Gen 5, Gen 3s aren't as big of a deal if maybe they um, kind of went out of vogue. So that's, I know, a concern a lot of people had, but to me, I, I think it's not that big of an issue. And I know some people had issue with, well, this isn't a defeat of the roster in its entirety because it still exists. Yes, it still would exist in to some degree, but it's essentially toothless. Now, what's been interesting in response to all of this has been really the lack of response from Gavin Newsom from the state of California and from the attorney general, Rob Bonta. The only thing I've seen so far was one kind of press release released on the DOJ's website from the attorney general, Rob Bonta, essentially saying that, you know, the unsafe handgun act is critical for the safety of California gun owners and we will defend it. Um, and we're looking into all of our options right now. That was interesting because typically when a lawsuit like this happens, and we get a pro to a win. So think back to like when we got the roadie wins, the Miller win, the Duncan win. When we got all those wins in the state of California, very quickly, and even just think about the Supreme Court, when the Supreme Court issued the Bruin decision, almost immediately you had Gavin Newsom, Rob Bonta put together a press release and just decried and, you know, went after the Supreme Court. You know, when the Miller stuff happened, they went after. Judge Benitez, they're still going after Judge Benitez, attacking those decisions and stating that they would appeal immediately and they appealed immediately. As of right now, we haven't seen a whole lot of response from the state of California. Now, they could just be simply playing possum and waiting for something else to play out, which we're going to talk about here in just a second, which is the Rena case. They could be just simply biding their time because they know there is another decision coming and not only just in this handgun roster realm. But there are a whole lot of other decisions that are potentially coming soon, including the Miller ban on so-called assault weapons, including the Duncan ban on so-called large capacity magazines, including the roadie ammunition restrictions, and even the um, Fouts Billy Club decision. All of those are coming down the pipeline. We are just simply waiting for decisions right now. So the state of California is having to make this interesting calculus right now about how are they going to respond to these pro to a decisions in a post-Bruin world. And really, I think maybe they have a little bit more hesitation to take this up to the Ninth Circuit, mainly because of the Ninth Circuit's response after Bruin. Keep in mind, um, a lot of these cases that are now pending decisions in the lower courts were up before the Ninth Circuit. 
The Duncan case, which dealt with magazines, was up to the Supreme Court. Um, it was a case that was pending and was on hold for the Bruin decision. And then once Bruin hit, the Supreme Court remanded it back down to the Ninth Circuit en banc panel. And that dealt with magazines. The Ninth Circuit en banc panel essentially said that they did not want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. And so they kicked it all the way back down to Judge Benitez. They did the same thing with Miller. And they did the same thing with Rody and Rupp and a ton of other cases, Young v. Hawaii. The Ninth Circuit ran from the 2A cases as fast as possible in a post-Bruin world. So the state of California is probably looking at that and seeing that the Ninth Circuit, even though it does in some degree lean liberal and anti-gun, even the Ninth Circuit showed great hesitation after Bruin in wanting to analyze these cases. They just sent them back down to the lower courts to restart over again. Obviously, that probably was also part of a stall tactic. Because uh, why address something if you could just simply kick it back down and you don't have to take all the brunt of the blow, leave it to the lower courts and essentially force it to work its way back up to you. It's probably what a lot of the Ninth Circuit was thinking. But again, it just it indicates maybe a lack of confidence on part of the Ninth Circuit and a lot of those judges of wanting to address these cases using the Bruin analysis, which is text as informed by relevant history, and that relevant history is dating back only to 1791. And again, that's a great, a grave, grave deviation from what the United Circuit has used prior, which was the two-step approach, interest balancing. Essentially, any time that a 2A case got before the United Circuit, for the most part, they would just simply say intermediate scrutiny should be used. The state of California has put forward some sort of public interest argument, for example, in the magazine ban cases, the state of California would simply just say, well, it helps to lessen casualties during mass casualty incidents. And that's the, a good enough public interest argument to justify this restriction in the state of California. And the Ninth Circuit en banc panel just bought that wholesale and just said, OK. Also, keep in mind, and this is important for maybe why the state of California is hesitating. Even in the Duncan case, you had a pro to a decision before Judge Benitez. Then you had a pro to a decision even at the three-judge panel level. And then it was only until the en banc panel reviewed it that, that they found that the magazine ban in their eyes was constitutional. But a three-judge panel in the Ninth Circuit found it was unconstitutional. And that really is because the makeup of the Ninth Circuit has changed drastically. One of the things, you know, despite whatever feelings you have about Donald Trump as our president, one of the really amazing things he did was he changed drastically the makeup of the Ninth Circuit in a lot of federal courts. Um, he put in place a lot of right-leaning pro-gun judges, and that has had huge implications at the Ninth Circuit level. Um, we've had awesome judges. I don't know if Bumate and like Van Dyke and Lee and uh, I don't think O'Scanlan or any of them were, were – uh, some of them may have been put in place by um, Donald Trump – but we've seen a lot of amazing pro to a judges in the Ninth Circuit. And the demographics of the Ninth Circuit are a little bit more 50-50 now. So it's not just a sure shot that the Ninth Circuit is going – or that California will get the judges that they want from the Ninth Circuit. Even if they were to appeal this Bolin decision, let's say you know they have the 14 days, they decide to appeal and seek a stay from the Ninth Circuit, depending on what draw a three-judge panel you get – it may not play out well how California wants at all. I mean, if you get a panel like with like Bumate, Van Dyke, and some of these other ones, you're done. They're going to deny your stay. They're going they're going to um, maybe take your appeal, but they're going to deny your stay. And then ultimately, you're probably going to lose before the three-judge panel. So California is having to make these interesting uh, decisions right now of how do they want to play this? Do they want to take this to the Ninth Circuit have broader impacts, not just for California, how the decision plays out, but this is going to impact other states like I believe Washington, Oregon, and others. You know, do they want to do that or do they want to stop the bleeding now and just sit on this decision, say, okay, we'll let it go into effect, let it impact California, but under the Boland decision, we'll still technically have the roster and we'll have a little bit of control of of approving manufacturers' guns and, and putting them on the roster. So that might be a decision California is making right now. We don't know. And again, I want to emphasize that as of right now, we are in a holding pattern, essentially. The judge here, Judge Carney in the Boland case, 
did it grant a motion for preliminary injunction in favor of the plaintiffs. So he enjoined the safety feature requirements under the Unsafe Handgun Act. But he did put a 14-day stay on the enforcement of that decision, which means his decision will not go into effect for 14 days. And I believe it doesn't go into effect until April 3rd uh, at 5 o'clock, something like that. So it's 14 days from last Monday. You, You can count that. So right now we're in a weird phase and we're still waiting to see how the state of California will respond. Now, with all of this, again, with the response of the state of California being fairly quiet, even the anti-gun organizations have been very, very quiet about this decision. I haven't really seen anything from Everytown, Giffords, Brady, Mom Demand Action. Uh, Usually when a decision like this comes out, you will see all of their Twitter accounts just absolutely blow up. They will freak out and they will come out and they'll do public statements with Gavin Newsom and, and Rob Bonta. And, and you haven't seen any of that. So it's just been very interesting. Just the weird radio silence that's going on right now could be a positive thing. Again, they might just decide to lick their wounds and, and stop the bleeding. Now um, we'll have to wait and see, but we have those 14 days, but even with all that, Something else has developed interestingly. Boland was a fairly newer case. It only was filed within the last like year or so. And there was a case that was existing prior to that one, which was the Rena v. Bercera and became Rena v. Bonta. That was actually a case. Rena is a case I worked on when I first joined FPC as one of their in-house counsel. I helped with that case with some of the plaintiffs and some of the uh, complaints and, and amending stuff and some of the documents. So it was a case that I, you know, I was very familiar with and I was very happy about because, again, being a California resident, it was something that was going to directly impact me. So it's a case that's been around for a while and then was changed a little bit because of Bruin and what, you know, I think there was like a third amended complaint that ended up happening in that one. And then a renewed call for a preliminary injunction to be granted in favor of the plaintiffs. And then also, I believe they filed for a motion for summary judgment. And in the Rena case, there were arguments that were already heard and we were just simply waiting for a decision. So there was Boland and Renna going at the same time. And they were kind of at the same stage where we were just waiting to see how the judges would rule. You had Judge Carney in the Boland case, and then you had uh, Judge Sabra, who is the chief judge of the Southern District in, in California. He's in the Renna case. So we were just waiting to see how they would rule. Boland hit first, but Boland only impacted the safety features. Renna is a much larger challenge. Rena is much more comprehensive. It's even acknowledged by the state of California and the court in the recent hearings, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. But Rena is a challenge to both aspects. It's a challenge to the safety features, but also just the roster requirements at large, the DOJ reporting, all of that stuff. So Rena could have broader impacts. Not to say that Bolin wasn't important because Bolin's very important. I'll take any win we can get. Bolin is, is huge. I, I, again, it upsets me when people try to say that Bolin is limited in some way and isn't as important. It really bugs me because that it's a very important decision. Again, like I said, it makes the roster essentially toothless because of that decision. But Rena is a little bit more comprehensive in scope. And in response to Bolin being issued and that decision being issued, Judge Sabra in the Rena case Uh, came out last week and held what is known as a status conference. And essentially it's you get together with all the parties and sometimes it's just simply scheduling um, issues. Sometimes you just set, you know, when you need to file briefs and stuff like that. This one was specific to what impact Bolin v. Bonta and that decision will have on this case. And so those hearings were held that, I mean, and so that status conference was held. And ultimately what we found out came out of that was that the chief judge there, Dana Sabra, agreed with the plaintiffs and the state of California that the Rena case is larger in scope, has broader impacts. It's requesting broader relief um, from the courts. And what he said is that he is going to move as fast as possible to issue his opinion. And that's important because it's, it, and also I want to note something else. The state of California also conceded that Rena is larger in its scope and also agreed that the judge there should issue his decision. Because one of the things that was up in the air was maybe the judge here, Dana Sabra, would just simply 
put his decision on hold, not issue his decision and just simply wait and see how Boland played out. But since Rena is larger in scope, they are going to proceed forward with him issuing his opinion. And California also wanted that. So again, I, like I said, they could just simply be waiting to see how Rena plays out to really evaluate what the damage is with the combination of Rena and Boland before they decide how they want to tackle the appeal process and the uh, request for stays and, and things of that nature. So again, it could be a little bit strategic with what California is doing. And all of this is to say that right now this issue is very dynamic because Rena is a little bit larger in scope. What could end up happening, let's say Monday, um, we wake up and at, you know, whatever time, not 10 o'clock, usually, you know, courts are starting to their activities. Let's say 10 o'clock, uh, Judge Dana Sabra on the Rena case drops his decision saying that, yes, he's going to strike down both the handgun roster itself and also the safety features with that redundancy with Boland. Then you would have a combination of decisions with Boland and Rena where the roster is essentially obliterated. You know, again, this is all hypothetical, but it's very, it's a very real possibility. And, you know, there could also be a situation where Dana Sabra um, says that maybe his goes into effect immediately, or maybe he only stays his, the effectiveness of his decision for the same amount of time that's left in Boland. Um, there's a combination of things that could play out, but ultimately also let's say California then decides that they don't want to appeal. Then there is the potential where you could walk into a gun store with a combination of the Rena decision, the Bolin decision, and be able to purchase whatever handgun you want. Because then if Rena goes our way, you wouldn't have the DOJ reporting and approval process that's still present under Bolin. You know, again, all hypothetical. Uh, we all have to wait and see how the decisions come out. But this is now a consideration that's happening in California and California is having to evaluate. Um, I still believe in my heart of hearts that California is ultimately going to appeal these decisions. Um, I don't think that they're, I don't think that they are going to let these decisions sit, especially because they're just going to be a slew of decisions that are likely going to come out. Um, you know, you're going to have the handgun roster, the assault weapons ban, the magazine ban, the ammunition restriction. California is not going to let any of these slip by. They are going to appeal these. The game becomes, what three judge panel do you get for each of these cases? Are they going to grant stays or not? The timing of some of these things, um, because even when you're requesting a stay, since it, a lot of these stays are not on an emergency basis, they're just traditional stays being sought from the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. You know, you're filing your brief for a request of stay, and then the opposing party gets time to file their response to that to say, well, like, why the court should not grant their stay. So, even when you're going through the traditional process of a stay, there is some time period lag because all the parties need to be given an opportunity to um, be heard on whether or not a stay should be granted or not. And the state of California, in some of these cases, and it definitely appears in Bolin, is not filing for emergency stays. You know, it's at this point, it would be very hard for them to argue that they need this emergency stay when they've sat on ish of, of seeking a stay for the last seven days now or whatever. Um, it's hard to argue there was an emergency when you didn't file for seven days. You know, when Duncan happened and when Rody happened, I mean, especially look at Rody, when the first Rody decision happened from Judge Benitez and Judge Benitez said that he was striking down the ammunition restrictions at large and was not going to grant a stay and it went into effect immediately. The state of California that night Overnight, when the court was closed, filed an emergency stay up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit granted it almost immediately. So you can see how some of these processes work, but that's not what California is doing here. So it would be very hard for them to argue that they need an emergency stay. It's just going to likely go through these, you know, traditional process of a stay request. Um, then there's going to be briefs filed in response and opposition. And then there could even be a hearing on whether or not a stay should be granted or not, which is interesting. And all this takes time. So, you know, all that process is going to take, you know, weeks, you know, could take a month, could take longer. 
you know, all that is a process. It's a legal process with very specific, you know, timing requirements of how many days you get to file this paper versus this paper and, and setting hearings and all this stuff. And all while that's going on, the clock is ticking on those 14 days, at least in the bond ticket in the Bolin case. And during that time, there is the potential that gun manufacturers are going to be submitting their handguns to DOJ and DOJ will need to start the process of putting them on the roster. Like I said, I anticipate that they'll slow walk the process, but it will get moving at least. Um, and there could be potential that even under Boland, people get access to handguns. And also with all this is interesting, the Ninth Circuit is probably a little bit concerned in seeing how things are playing out in the Second Circuit with the Concealed Carry Improvement Act that the state of New York passed in response to Bruin. In all of those cases, and you know, there's like five or six now, you know, the state of New York sought, so, and a lot of those, what ended up happening is the district courts there in New York found that the Concealed Care Improvement Act that New York passed was indeed unconstitutional in some regards, and then granted preliminary injunctions against those. And then the state of New York said, well, we don't like that. We're not going to let that sit. So we're going to appeal this up to the Second Circuit. Now, the Second Circuit, in response to those appeals and requests for stays, just decided flippantly, I'm going to grant your stays. So they granted a bunch of stays in those cases. Again, like I said, there are traditional processes of how things happen with filing briefs, potential hearings and arguments and things of that nature. But the Second Circuit didn't do that. And that led to the whole issue of then GOA through their attorneys filing emergency applications up to the Supreme Court, seeking immediate uh, review of the Second Circuit granting those stays and requesting that the Supreme Court strike down those stays and remove those stays. And ultimately, what the Supreme Court ended up doing is saying, Second Circuit, you issued these stays so flippantly, you need to at least um, have briefings and hearings on these cases as fast as possible, or else we're going to step in and allow the plaintiffs to then seek review from us once again. So essentially force the Second Circuit's hand to have those hearings to really review whether or not those stays are appropriate. And again, like I said, the Ninth Circuit is probably a little bit hesitant now seeing how that's played out in the Second Circuit because a lot of times these left-leaning anti-gun circuit courts have just issued these stays very flippantly. But now at least it appears that the Supreme Court is being hypercritical of circuit courts doing that and also hypercritical of circuit courts going rogue based on that they just don't like the Bruin decision. So a lot of moving parts with all of this, you know, we really are in a little bit of unprecedented, you know, time right now because of how drastic there has been a shift because of the Bruin decision prior, you know, you could pretty much guess how this stuff was going to play out. You could just say, oh, they're just, and I, I still see it now, you know, when I put out videos or, or talk about this stuff online or just talk about with people in general, you know, people are still using the same arguments based on what we've seen play out, you know, historically out of the Ninth Circuit. There, People are just saying, oh, California is just going to appeal this. They're going to get a stay from the Ninth Circuit. It's eventually going to go on Bach, and then we're going to have to wait for the Supreme Court. You, well, yeah, when it was just two-step approach interest balancing, but a lot of things have changed, and a lot of development, a lot of things have developed. There have been a ton of pro-2A pro decisions um, not just in California, but in New York from district courts, in Texas, in North Dakota. I mean, just all over the place. Uh, it seems like the tides are definitely shifting as far as pro to a decisions. So I think it's a little bit of a little bit foolish to just say like these things are going to go the traditional process like we've seen them play out before. I think there are going to be some very interesting developments in these cases and a lot of untraditional things that catch people off guard. You know. Even when you talk about, you know, the first Freedom Week, you know, that really caught people off guard because it was one judge ruling in a pro to a way, you know, and of course, Judge Benitez was way ahead of his time. He was doing text history and tradition analysis even before the Supreme Court said in Bruin that, yes, that 100 percent is the correct type of analysis. So with all that is to say that I don't think we can just simply just, you know, disregard this as it's going to go the same way that we've seen before. We really don't know. You know, the whole landscape 
of Second Amendment litigation has changed drastically, and especially on the side of the Pro 2A where we have the attorneys and organizations filing these lawsuits. They just have so many more tools to their disposal that they didn't have before. Now our side is totally on the offensive. We have Supreme Court precedent and history on our side and California and these anti-gun governments and, and agencies are really the ones finally on defensive and they can't just rely on these same old arguments that they had used before. And even these circuit courts can no longer just simply defer to those. So I, I'm very positive. I'm very, you know, I expect that a lot of really good things are going to happen going forward. Like I said, I think in California, we're going to get a slew of good decisions. I think Boland was just the start. You know, we saw the Miller two with the fee shifting go our way recently. I think Rena is going to go our way. I think Miller's going to go our way. I think then um, Duncan's going to go our way and Rody's going to go our way. And then down the road, even the Rupp decision, which is a just, you know, kind of um, similar to Miller, but Miller is an attack to the features restrictions under California Penal Code 30515, where Rupp is a little bit more comprehensive, where it attacks the Roberti Roos list plus the features. So think of like Rupp as the Rena case and Miller as the Boland case, really. So I think we're just going to get a ton of, of good decisions. And then it just is on the state of California. How how bad do they want to make this for themselves? Do they want to take it up to the Ninth Circuit and try their hand and see how the Ninth Circuit decides they want to address this? Because there's also no guarantee that the Ninth Circuit is going to try to find a way around Bruin. Now, yes, there are probably some judges that will try to find a way around the Bruin rationale or tried to really rely on history that's not relevant. But we've seen quite a few judges say, well, you know what? The Supreme Court said what the Supreme Court said. Our hands are really tied because of how this um, analysis is supposed to work. And they just are issuing the decisions according to Bruin. So there is no guarantee that the Ninth Circuit is going to rule in California's favor. And I think that's really what they're concerned about. And who knows, you know, a lot of the attorney generals in other states like Oregon and Washington might be calling Gavin Newsom and saying, like, hey, no, don't appeal this. Stop the bleeding. Take your loss, you know, because, you know, Washington and Oregon and some of these other states are doing their own things with their own anti-gun laws. So they might not want something coming out of the state of California that's going to impact their laws. So, you know, that's just a quick rundown. Some of my thoughts about what's going on with the California handgun roster and just California in general and and how some of these things are very dynamic and how things could change going forward and what to expect. A couple of the things you, you're going to want to really keep your eyes on is first the 14-day time timeline for Boland. We're going to just wait and see how California is going to respond, if they're going to file an appeal, if they're going to request a stay. I suspect that they will. Um, but it's just interesting that they haven't said a whole lot yet. So that's the first thing you're going to keep your eyes on. And then the second thing is really just keep an eye out for the Rena decision because the judge there said that he's going to try to issue his decision as soon as possible. And a positive Rena decision will really just complement the Boland case well, depending on what the judge says. And it could also help get rid of the DOJ reporting requirements that weren't necessarily addressed in the Boland case. Um, at least I don't, I'm not sure hundred percent if they were addressed like during any arguments or anything like that, but at least the judge in Boland uh, only struck down the features requirement. So there's a little bit greater potential with the Rena case, but that should give you guys a good idea of where we sit right now as when I put out this podcast, you know, again, things are very dynamic and could change over time. So keep an eye out on my main channel. I'm going to try to update you guys if anything else develops and get you guys information as soon as possible and as fast as possible. So if you need to do something, especially if it's in regards to the handgun roster or ban on so-called assault weapons, magazines, ammunition, anything like that, I will try to let you know as soon as possible and give you guys just my educated uh, reading of whatever opinions come out so you guys can know what you need to do. Again, none of it's ever legal advice, but you know, I know a lot of you guys want my opinion of, of what's going on. So hopefully that helped you guys out. If you guys like this uh, podcast, make sure you comment down below. Uh, let me know kind of what you guys are looking forward to as far as the handgun roster, maybe something you are looking forward to purchasing, um, maybe you know what you've had your eye on for a while. 
Um, again, if you're listening to this on the audio format on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, make sure you are leaving reviews uh, because that really helps the algorithm over there. And if you're watching and listening to this over on YouTube, uh, make sure you like, commenting, and subscribe to this channel. This is a dedicated podcast channel. This is not my main channel, so I know some people seem to be confused about that. But this is specifically for the podcast. This is where we're hosting the podcast. Uh, it's different from the main channel. So make sure you're subscribed to this channel as well so you're, make, so you're getting all the podcasts. But regardless, thank you guys so much for all of your support. And as always, thank you all for listening. And don't forget this nation was built by Farm Scholars, and this nation will be maintained by Farm Scholars.